Join us at Walters on Friday, October 4th for our end of season podcast party. Evening is scheduled from 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. We're driven by the search for better. But when it comes to hiring, the best way to search for a candidate isn't to search at all. Don't search match with Indeed. Indeed is your matching and hiring platform with over 350 million global monthly visitors, according to Indeed data, and a matching engine that helps you find quality candidates fast. Ditch the busy work. Use Indeed for scheduling, screening, and messaging so you can connect with candidates faster. Leveraging over 140 million qualifications and preferences every day, Indeed's matching engine is constantly learning from your preferences, so the more you use Indeed, the better it gets. Join more than 3.5 million businesses worldwide that use Indeed to hire great talent fast. And listeners of this show will get a $75 sponsored job credit to get your jobs more visibility at Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Just go to Indeed.com slash BlueWire right now and support our show by saying that you heard about Indeed on this podcast. That's Indeed.com slash BlueWire. Terms and conditions apply. Need to hire? You need Indeed. Left-hander rocks, kicks, delivers the pitch. Swing to ground ball, slowly hit left side. Charging in Abrams, fields cleanly. Fires to a stretching Gallo. Good play in time, and the inning is over. So, Mackenzie Gore does it again. Five straight, one, two, three innings. 15 up and 15 down to start this game for Gore. He's taken this count full. Three balls, two strikes. Here it comes. Breaking ball, just low. A curve just missing. He had locked him up in the pitch just below the knees. And the Marlins have their first base runner. Gore's perfect game bid ends after five and a third. Law coming set. Here's the pitch on the way. Swinging a line drive over the leaping Abrams. Base in left center field. The Marlins win. Conine scores. 4-3 Miami. And for the first time this season, the Marlins defeat the Nationals. And welcome to Nats Chat for Thursday, September 5th. 2024. I'm Al Galdi, host of the Al Galdi podcast. Mark Zuckerman is off for this installment of the podcast, but I'm joined by the man who runs the podcast, Tim Shovers. Uh, The Nationals will not go unbeaten against the Miami Marlins in this regular season. We were thinking that that might happen. Uh, That unfortunately will not happen. Uh, Wednesday evening, a 4-3, 10-inning loss for the Nats at the uh, National League East worst Marlins, dropping the Nats to 8-1 against the Marlins this regular season in which the Nats now are 62 and 77 overall. The Nats and Marlins end up splitting this uh, two game series. Uh, frustrating loss for the Nats. They overcame a 2 0 eighth inning deficit, but then blew a 3 2 eighth inning lead. This installment of the Nats Chat Podcast brought to us by Window Nation. Call Window Nation 866 90 Nation or visit windownation.com to learn about Window Nation's great offer. Buy two windows, get two windows free. There was a lot to this game on Wednesday evening. Mackenzie Gore was good again. Three consecutive outings now that he's been good. In fact, he flirted with a perfect game. The Nats scored three runs in the top of the eighth, but the Nats bullpen was not good, and the Nats offense overall uh, was not good. So, Tim, winnable game, but unfortunately, a uh, Nationals loss. A very winnable game. Mackenzie Gore pitches very well, if not excellent. They don't take advantage of it. They rally against the bullpen, but the Nats bullpen comes up short. And this is something that seems like they've gotten away from. But I remember when they first added the ghost runner rule, the Nats could not score in the extra innings ever. Like it seemed like they would always come up short and lose. And it was a continuation of this tonight, unable to bring in a guy from second with no outs. Yeah, Kevin Franzen has talked about this on Masson. When you get the first at bats in extras and you don't score, the likelihood of you winning plummets. And that's what it feels like. If the Nats are on the road and it's an extra inning game and they don't score in that top of the 10th, you don't feel great (laughs) about uh, what's going to happen. And uh, sure enough, we had that happen in this game. So yeah, the Nats bullpen. Look, the bullpen is not going to be great in every game. This game was not a particularly good game and the offense did not leave a lot of margin for error for the bullpen. So four Nats relievers combined to allow three runs, two earned in three and a third innings. Uh, Jacob Barnes allowed one run in one inning. He in the bottom of the seventh allowed a run on a one-out five-pitch walk of Jonah Bride and a two-out first pitch opposite field RBI double by Otto Lopez to the right center field gap 
for a 2 nothing Marlins lead. You know, Barnes had been doing really well. He's come back down to earth here lately. Jose A. Ferrer officially allowed one run in two-thirds of an inning. He and Wood ended up being a one-run eighth for the Marlins. Uh, retired the first two batters, but then gave up back-to-back two out singles. We then had Kyle Finnegan. He made his first appearance in a game in seven days. This has been remarkable with Kyle Finnegan. He has barely pitched since the Nats ended up not trading him prior to that 2024 MLB trade deadline on July 30th. He barely pitched in August. He has barely pitched in September. So he comes into this game. He officially tosses one and a third scoreless innings with two swinging strikeouts. But Finnegan gave up a big hit and to the first batter he faced. He came into the game in the bottom of the eighth with runners on first and second, two outs, and the Nats holding a 3-2 lead. And Finnegan, to the first batter he faced, gave up a two-out RBI single by Jake Berger to left field to tie the game at three. The single per stat cast, an exit velocity of 115.5 miles per hour. Let me repeat that, 100. 15.5 miles per hour, by far the highest exit velocity of the game as Finnegan continues to give up rock hard contact. I've been harping on this. I'm going to continue to harp on this as long as Finnegan keeps doing this. He gives up such nasty contact <laughs> and he did that again in this spot. Now he did then toss a scoreless bottom of the ninth, but Derek Law in the bottom of the 10th Gave up a walk-off, one-out, opposite field RBI single by Xavier Edwards to left center field on a 1-2 pitch for a 4-3 Nats loss. So like I said, bullpen's not going to be perfect every game. This was not a particularly good game, though, for the Nats bullpen. No, it wasn't. The most disappointing part is it was such a winnable game. That's to me was sort of, you know, these are going to happen, but it's a shame because the two-game sweep against the last place Marlins was right there on the table. Jacob Barnes feels like it's been a while since there's been any criticism of him. It's sort of like he kind of went from a name at the back end of the bullpen to sort of, it seemed like he was in the A bullpen. Let's see how he bounces back from here. The Finnegan usage is impossible to track. As you mentioned here, it's been a real roller coaster ride ever since the trade deadline for him. Yes, Derek Law didn't pitch that well, and I know he's already been back, but I'm just happy he's back on the mound, to be frank. <laughs> That's still the thought I have in my head, because when I heard right flexor strain, I thought no chance is this guy coming back in 2024. Yeah, he missed minimal time. And, you know, it's hard to really evaluate his outing on Wednesday evening. He only faced a couple of batters, gives up the run because of the uh, ghost runner. So, you know, it ends up being an unearned run. The Finnegan thing is just wild. I mean, they don't trade him and they barely used him. Now, they're not not using him because like they don't like him. They're not using him because just circumstances aren't arising. Although I would argue if you value him as your top reliever, then maybe you need to force usage a little bit more and not go, you know, six, seven days without using the guy if in fact you believe him to be your top reliever. But it's funny, he's pitching now with the same frequency that Tanner Rainey was pitching earlier this season. Like if you didn't know better, you'd think that Finnegan is being bearded. You'd think that Finnegan is a rule five drafty with how infrequently he's appearing in games, but he gets into this game and, you know, he did some good things. It's not like he got shellacked in this game, but, you know, he comes into the game big spot, and he immediately gives up that hit. And like I said, he got scorched on that hit by Jake Berger. So what happened with the Nats bullpen in this game especially stands out because the efforts of the Nats relievers uh, ended up wasting an excellent outing by Mackenzie Gore. Let's not lose sight of this. Mackenzie Gore appears to be back on track. We were hoping that this would happen. We didn't know if this was going to happen with how badly Gore was struggling But he on Wednesday evening was good for a third consecutive start. One run in six innings, nine strikeouts versus one walk. He gave up just one hit, which was a double. He threw 93 pitches, 62 strikes versus 31 balls. Uh, Gore began the outing by tossing five and a third perfect innings. Bottom of the six, he issued a went out seven pitch walk of the Marlins number eight batter, Griffin Conine, the son of former Marlins first baseman slash outfielder Jeff Conine. And uh, Gore then gave up the hit, uh, the one out double, what was a one out RBI double by Nick Fortes to left field for a one nothing Marlins lead. It's funny how that is. You lose the perfect game and then you lose the no hitter right after that. You wonder if like Gore's focus got rattled a little bit there. But still, I mean, he was excellent in this game. And you look at Gore now over his last 
three outings. So he did what he did on Wednesday evening. His previous start came the previous Wednesday evening, August 28th, and adds 5-2 win over the New York Yankees at Nationals Park. Or in that game, two runs in six innings, six strikeouts versus one walk. And August 23rd, that adds a 3-2 10 inning loss at the Atlanta Braves. Score allowed one run in six innings. And in that game was extremely pitch efficient. So yes, he faced the lowly Marlins on Wednesday evening, but the previous two opponents were the Yankees and the Braves. And Gornell over his last three starts, four runs in 18 innings, 19 strikeouts versus two walks. That's more like it. He was reeling. You know, his season was unraveling, and he, over these last three outings, has gotten right back to where he was earlier this season. Really good to see. This is really encouraging. A major takeaway. Three consecutive solid outings for Gore. If you want to have confidence, if you want to talk yourself into opening day 2025, the Nats are going for it. The rebuild is behind us, or at least the bulk of it. They're going to be competitive. Wins and losses matter. Well, Mackenzie Gore is probably going to be the opening day starter. So having a different taste in your mouth about him going into the winter, it's not a small thing. And now as I look at it, I'm really excited for his next start on Tuesday next week against the Braves. He's only got a handful of starts left as we round the closing stretch here. And there's going to be a big difference between if he goes six or seven consecutive outings to end the year, or he just had three or four good outings in September sprinkled in with more bad like he had in August. So I think from a national standpoint, that's a lot to pay attention to in the final few weeks. It is. And, you know, his bad, he was bad in nine of 10 starts. Now he's been good each of his last three starts. So you're right. Like if he, if he goes back to being bad, you really don't feel so good about these three consecutive good starts. But if this is the start of a season ending run of, you know, six or seven good starts, or, you know, he ends the season being good in six of his final seven starts or whatever the breakdown might be, that would be terrific. Would love to see that. And, you know, like we shouldn't forget, he was really good earlier in the season. So it can be that we end up looking back upon the nine bad outings and 10 starts as, you know, a bad stretch in an otherwise good season. Now, that is a sizable chunk of your season, 10 starts, but you know, that doesn't have to like define your season. It doesn't have to be that his season got derailed and never got back on track again. So very encouraging to see Gore do as he did on Wednesday evening. Hey, Al Galdi here to tell you about the latest great offer from Window Nation for listeners of the Nats Chat Podcast. Two free windows for every two windows that you buy, plus pay nothing with no interest for two full years. If you have been thinking about getting new windows, now is the time. Get with Window Nation, 866-90NATION or Window Nation. Dot com and tell Window Nation that you want the deal that you heard about from Al Galdi on the Nats Chat Podcast. September has arrived. A great time to replace your old inefficient windows with energy efficient windows from Window Nation. You can get a free no obligation quote from Window Nation right now. Contacting Window Nation and seeing what new Window Nation windows would cost you costs you nothing, obligates you to nothing. 866-90NATION or Window Nation. Dot com and take advantage of the great offer for listeners of the Nats Chat Podcast. Two free windows for every two windows that you buy, plus pay nothing with no interest for two full years. 866-90-NATION or windownation.com. That's 866-90-NATION or windownation.com. And tell Window Nation that Al Galdi sent you. Hey, Nats Chat, want to tell you about Mint Mobile's premium wireless package starting at $15 a month when you purchase a three-month plan. All plans come with high-speed data and unlimited talk and text delivered on the nation's largest 5G network. To get this new customer offer and your new three-month premium wireless plan for just 15 bucks a month, go to mintmobile.com slash natschat. That's mintmobile.com slash natschat. Cut your wireless bill to 15 bucks a month at mintmobile.com slash natschat. $45 upfront payment required. New customers on first three-month plan only. Speed slower above 40 gigs on unlimited plan. Additional taxes, fees, and restrictions apply. See Mint Mobile for details. Now the set. Here's the pitch. Swing and a line drive. Base hit left center field. Tina speeding around third. He'll score. Chaparro around second heading for third. He will make it. And Woods already standing in the bag at second. With a double to left center field to put the Nationals in front for the first time tonight. 
His ninth double in the seventh inning, his tenth double of the year here in the eighth inning, and he drives in his 32nd run of the year. Runners on second and third with still only one out and three runs home. It's the Nationals three and the Marlins two. The Nats offense in this 4-3-10 inning loss at the Marlins on Wednesday evening. Just three runs, so all of which came in the top of the eighth. The Nats for the game had just five hits, uh, although three of them were doubles. The Nats also had two singles. The Nats did work five walks, but the Nats went one for 11 with runners in scoring position, especially in the earlier portion of the game. The Nats had base runners, the Nats had opportunities, and the Nats did not convert on these chances. A lot of leadoff batters for the Nats in this game got on base and just ended up uh, staying (laughs) on base and never coming home to score. So two of the Nats' three doubles in this game came from James Wood. He is the Nats' starting left fielder and number four batter. Went two for four with an RBI double and a leadoff double. Wood in the top of the seventh, a leadoff double to right field on an 0-2 pitch. And Wood in that Nats' three-run eighth, a one-out full count opposite field RBI double to the left center field gap for a 3-2 Nats lead despite having been down at one point, 1-2. That double for stat cast, another James Wood specialty, exit velocity of 101.2 miles per hour, tied for the Nats' second highest exit velocity of the game. And Wood had the other exit velocity that went 101.2 miles per hour. So we still want to see more homers from James Wood, but he gets himself a couple of doubles in this game. You look at him since being promoted to the majors, 237 plate appearances, OPS of 798. Dylan Cruz, he on Wednesday evening as the Nats starting right fielder and number one batter, 0 for 3, but with the two four-pitch walks, Cruz in the top of the first, a leadoff four-pitch walk, Cruz in the Nats three-run eighth, a four-pitch walk, so good to see Cruz get on base a few times. And the Nats' other double in this game came from Luis Garcia Jr. He is the Nats starting second baseman and number five batter, one for three with a double and a walk, but... He also got picked off as, yes, this would not be a Nationals game in the year 2024 without some kind of out made on the base paths. So Garcia in the top of the second drew a terrific walk. I want to give him credit for this. A leadoff nine pitch walk despite having been down in the count at 1.02. So really good plate discipline by Garcia. But he then got picked off at first base and registered a uh, caught stealing for the second out. The double by Garcia coming in the top of the fourth, a two-out double to right field on an 0-2 pitch. Luis Garcia Jr. continues to be number one among all qualified Nats players in OPS for this regular season, that OPS now at 780. So a lot of good stuff from Luis Garcia Jr., but boy, (laughs) getting picked off at just every game, we have to end up talking about something like this with this team. More business for Dr. Jeff, pediatrician of the stars with the boo-boo there. Uh, yeah, I mean, we're just, I'm so sick of it. We know this is going to come. But the Luis Garcia thing, I'll twist it to a positive, Al. 290 average. I know batting average isn't your thing, but it's still something I monitor. 20 points out of the batting title race, unlikely. But he's still in the hunt with a few weeks to go in September. That's a side thing for uh, people to follow there. So that's what I'm paying attention to while we're talking about a game in Miami. If I ask you who is the Nats MVP for this season, is the answer Luis Garcia Jr.? Are we at that point with him? Ooh, ah, uh, okay. I think it's Jacob Young. Because wins and losses aren't the focal point, unfortunately, still for this team, the fact that like it's a franchise center fielder popped up out of nowhere, even though statistically it doesn't match up with Luis Garcia, I would go with Young. Well, Young in this game had a great single. He only went one for four, but I did want to highlight this single that uh, Jacob Young provided. So he is the Nats starting center fielder and number nine batter, one for four with a single. Young in the Nats three-run eighth, full count, opposite field single to right field to conclude a 10 pitch plate appearance. There were some good at-bats by the Nats in that three-run eighth inning. I don't know that any at-bat was more impressive than what Young did in that spot. He has been so much better offensively lately, and he has been going the opposite way a good bit too here lately, and he did that there on that single. I think it's tough to give him MVP just because that OPS is still in the 600s, but I tell you what, the defense has been elite, the base running has been great, and if he continues to do well offensively and he gets the OPS into the 700s, I think there probably is a compelling 
Nationals MVP argument for Young. I think I'd go with Luis Garcia Jr., but at least, you know, with with Young, you can inject him into the conversation, uh, especially with this rise for him over these last few weeks. Are you looking for tickets to an upcoming event? That's why you should download the Game Time app. Create an account and use code NATSCHAT for $20 off your first purchase. You get cheaper tickets and it helps the podcast a bit. Sounds like a smooth 643 double play. Again, create an account and redeem the code NATSCHAT for $20 off. Terms apply. Download Game Time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price, guaranteed. Walters is a great place to watch all of the NFL Week 1 action. Walters always prioritizes sound and prime central TV showing for the Commanders game. This Sunday afternoon, Washington and Jaden Daniels visit the Tampa Bay Bucks at 425. What's up, everybody? It's Heisman Trophy winner Matt Leiner. I've got a podcast called Throwbacks with actor Jay Farrar where we'll be talking all things sports, but also so much more. We'll give you the behind the scenes stories from my days as the quarterback on an iconic college football team to Jerry's days as a star on an iconic TV series. So subscribe to Throwbacks wherever you download your podcast and follow us on all social media at Throwback Show. For those interested in learning a new language, whether it be Spanish, French, or something else, check out Babbel. Babbel's 10-minute lessons are quick and handcrafted by over 200 language experts, ready to get you talking about your new language in just three weeks, because talking is the key to really knowing any language. Designed by real people for having real conversations, Babbel gets you talking. With over 16 million subscriptions sold, Babbel's 14 award-winning language courses are backed by a 20-day money-back guarantee, so no pressure. Here's a special limited-time deal for our listeners right now. Get up to 60, that's 6-0% off, your Babbel subscription, but only for NatsChat listeners at babbel.com slash NatsChat. Get up to 60% off babbel.com slash NatsChat. Spelled B A B B E L dot com slash Nats Chat. Rules and restrictions may apply. He's working counts. He's seeing pitches. You know, he's swinging the bat. You know, well. So I like him up there. You know, he's you know he he's got a lot of energy, that kid. So you know, I appreciate the way he plays the game so far. And- As Jacob Young has been rising, we unfortunately have continued to see C.J. Abrams falling. Abrams, another bad game on Wednesday evening. He is an ad-starting shortstop and number seven batter for each of the two games in the series. Goes 0 for 4 in each of these two games. His OPS still is in the 700s. It tells you how good he was earlier this season. His OPS for this regular season at 734, but that is down from 857 at the end of June. Tim, we keep waiting for Abrams to get going again, and it's not happening, and it still could happen, and I hope like heck that it does happen, but this is now two plus months that we have been waiting for him to get going again, and we're still waiting. The Nats have a problem on their hands here. C.J. Abrams, the final part of the season, has been awful. He's now hitting 240, which is really eye-popping, considering the All-Star game wasn't all that long ago, if you look at the calendar. The series in Atlanta, Al, I was getting multiple texts from people that watch the Braves and don't watch the Nats. They're like, what's going on with C.J. Abrams here? Like, this is the worst shortstop I've ever seen. Now, that's hyperbole, but for people just checking in, they were like, what is the deal with this? Who is this guy? And it's like, not only is he their shortstop, he's their franchise shortstop, and he was their all-star representative not that long ago. This season cannot end fast enough for C.J. Abrams. I don't know what's going on. The calendar needs to get to October 1st, and then we just need to meet up with him again in February in West Palm. There wasn't a conversation a few months ago regarding who the Nats MVP was. The answer was C.J. Abrams, and it seemed like a slam dunk that that's who we would end up labeling as the Nats MVP for this season. But as the season has gone on, you don't feel as good saying that. Now, 
you know, he still is a prominent Nat in terms of things like war and, like I said, OPS. But, you know, you break down his season, he has been good in just two of the five completed months. He was very good in April. He was very good in June. His May was really bad. His July was really bad. His August was really bad. And his September so far has been really bad. So if we end up with him being bad in four out of the six months, (laughs) you know, what are we talking about here? It's tough, man. He's so talented. I still feel like he's going to get going again, but, you know, we don't have that much time left in the season. So if he's going to get going again, it needs to happen sometime, you know, in the next, what, uh, 10 days, 14 days, something like that. Otherwise, you're talking about, you know, you're in the dying days of the season. And, you know, I was thinking about this, too. So I think ideally, if everyone is going well, Abrams is part of the top three of the Nationals lineup. Abrams, Dylan Cruz, James Wood in whatever order you want to put him in. But with Dylan Cruz now up and him being a fixture in that number one spot, I wonder if we're done with Abrams in that number one spot. That seemed like his spot. That seemed like his thing. If you remember when he really took off last season, it essentially coincided with him being bumped up to that number one spot. And this season, he had been a staple in either the uh, number one or number two spot. Lately, we're seeing him bat in the sixth spot, seeing him bat in the seventh spot. Even if he gets going again, you know, I don't think it's a given that he's just right back to that number one spot. That might be Dylan Cruz's spot for the time being. So I do wonder if we've seen the last of Abrams uh, as the Nats' uh, regular leadoff batter. I'm going to steal a phrase that you have used a lot on the radio, Al, and we have a developing situation as it relates to leadoff. If you watch or listen to Davey Martinez's pregame press conference, he talked about Cruz being in the leadoff spot, and he sounded very complimentary. And Abrams is now, what, hitting seventh in the lineup? Cruz can draw walks. Cruz has the ability to hit leadoff. Cruz doesn't seem like a third or a fourth hitter, and I don't know if he's a second hitter. So, yeah, this is a big change. And then also, by the way, Jacob Young seems to be your perfect number nine hitter in a non pitchers are hitting anymore situation where we now have DHs. So I don't know where CJ Abrams fits into the lineup. I mean, you really crystallize something very important that's happening here with the team. It's going to be so interesting with next season, right? Because if the Nats get a big bat this off season, you know, that guy is going to bat in the top three, top four easily. So you'll have that. I would think James Wood next season is a staple in the top three, top four. I don't, I don't think we're going to be seeing him bat, you know, fifth or sixth or anything like that, unless he's really struggling, which you know nobody's anticipating. Same thing with Dylan Cruz, Luis Garcia Jr. To me, has earned the right to be batting higher in lineups, and I think you could see that next season. In other words, it's getting competitive. It potentially is going to be very competitive in terms of where guys bat. And, you know, you're not going to see any more guys with OPSs in the five and six hundreds being gifted number four spots in lineups, as we have seen in recent years. Like, I think you could really start to see a true formidable Nationals lineup really starting next season as these guys mature. And like I said, as the Nats perhaps add a bat or two of consequence this offseason. So, yeah, it'll be interesting to see what happens with Abrams. But, you know, before we get locked into like where he hits, he just needs to be better. He needs to end his season in a strong way. I hope he does. I think he can. But like I said, we're not exactly seeing that right now. So the Nats split this series at the Marlins. Next up is a four-game series at the Pirates, who have been one of the worst teams in the majors for a while now. The Pirates now have become masters of like doing the following every season. Get off to a hot start. Get people in Pittsburgh all excited (laughs) that the Pirates are back and then completely collapse. And I know this because my wife is from Pittsburgh. She's a Pirates fan. Her father is a huge Pirates fan. So I don't like follow the Pirates like I follow the Nats and the Orioles. But, you know, I do pay attention to them. And every year now, it feels like for the last, I don't know, three, four, five years, the Pirates have done the same thing. Good April. Get people excited and then completely fall off the cliff. And that has happened this season. The Pirates have been one of the poor teams since the All-Star break. So this is an opportunity for the Nats to pick up two wins, three wins, maybe more. We'll see. I mean, you can't just assume a four-game sweep. But uh, this is a very beatable team. No Paul Skeens in this series. The Pirates are going now with a six-man rotation. So the Nats will avoid uh, Skeens in this series. So an opportunity for the Nats uh, to pick up a decent chunk of wins here these next four days. I remember reading an article the day after game 162 in Pittsburgh last year. Pirates were talking about how optimistic they were. Everyone was looking for 2024. The NL Central is real vulnerable. And here you look up 
and they're in last place, just like usual. And also, I have to say, Al, look at the standings. Third place in the NL Central over 500. I wouldn't have thought that pretty much until recently. That division was looking like 84 wins might take the flag, and things have flipped there. I'm bummed, selfishly, would have loved to see them face Skeens, but they'll have plenty of opportunities in the future. They will. And uh, as much as, like, from an entertainment standpoint, you wanted to see the Nats face Skeens, Dylan Cruz face Skeens, I think the Nats themselves are probably just fine uh, not facing Paul Skeens. So game one of this uh, four-game series at the Pirates Thursday evening at 640. Jake Irvin will be the Nats starting pitcher. This installment of the Nats Chat Podcast brought to us by Window Nation. Call Window Nation, 866-90NATION. Visit windownation.com to learn more about Window Nation's ongoing offer. Buy two windows, get two windows free. You can hit us up on X at Nats underscore chat. You can email the podcast, Nats Chat Podcast at gmail.com. You can find us on our website as well, natschatpodcast.com, at which you can purchase the Nats Chat Podcast t shirt. All Nationals radio highlights on Nats Chat are courtesy of 1067 The Fan. For Tim Shovers, I'm Al Galdi. We thank you for listening, and we'll talk to you next time on the Nats Chat Podcast.